brief are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Alliance to Transform CalFresh webinar on college student hunger in California. I am Sarah Palmer DeFrank. I work at the California Association of Food Banks and am a member of the Alliance, as well as uh, lead the County Advocate Program. So today we're going to be talking about the issue of student hunger in California. Um, it is a huge problem. There are many really amazing people, advocates, thought leaders who are working very hard to get food to our college student population. So just a little bit about the Alliance to Transform CalFresh. Um, we have a new goal. It is to raise the CalFresh participation rate to at least 80% by the end of 2019 with no county below 70%. And we realize that is a lofty goal, but we believe that it's attainable largely in part because of the relationships we have that we're going to be highlighting on this webinar today. Um, we'll be doing that with a couple of different um, strategies. One is quick, consistent, connected, and equitable. And um, we'll talk a little bit about that today. Um, namely, we're going to be focusing on access and, and overall participation. And on today's webinar, we have a number of really amazing presenters. Uh, Jessica Barcelo with the Western Center on Law and Poverty. Sabrina Sanders, Dr. Sabrina Sanders at CSU uh, Chancellor's Office. Ruben Candeno with the UC Student Hunger Initiatives, um, a really great advocate that we have. And Amanda Schultz Brochu, San Diego, San Diego Hun Hunger Coalition. And Amy Dearlam of River City Food Banks. Um, those two advocates will be sharing kind of a local county approach to pro solving this hunger problem amongst our student population. And then lastly, we'll have Gustavo Herrera from Young Invincibles talking about um, organizing around college poverty. So first up, we have Jessica Bartholo of the Western Center on Law and Poverty. Jessica, please take it away. Thanks so much, Sarah. And thanks to the Alliance to Transform CalFresh, uh, to the Association of Food Banks, who is hosting and sponsoring today's call, and uh, to everybody who's joining. I have for you, anybody who's live tweeting our conversation today, some hashtags and um, some Twitter handles that you can go ahead and tag in order for us to follow along. Next slide, please. So what I, my, my job today is to highlight two pieces of uh, legislation that are moving us forward in addressing the crisis of college student hunger. But before I do that, I'll just briefly state what's at stake if we don't. Um, for students who are low income and make it to college, they're among the best and brightest in their institution. They um, have gotten there from a great deal of help from their, many, many of them public schools um, and the public school system. Uh, they're there with Cal Grants and with Pell Grants and um, other federal student loans. And we have invested as a society in these low-income students so that they can um, diversify and bring a new lens to, to what we know um, as academics in our universities um, and in our various fields. Um, when these college students are hungry uh, or lack other basic needs, we're undermining those students, we're undermining our investments in them, and we're undermining our future. Uh, when we only have people in college who can afford to be there, we lose out on a great opportunity to learn and expand our thinking. So with that, um, everybody hopefully on the call is already aware of the challenges that hunger students experience on campus. And if you're not, we're going to hear more about the research that's being done um, as we speak and that was done uh, previously and reported this year um, about the level of hunger. Um, gratefully, we have two pieces of legislation that we're already implementing as, a, as an effort to reduce 
the experience of hunger on college campus. This is just the beginning. We need to do more, and I anticipate that there will be more hearings and more legislation introduced as students on campuses begin to identify uh, the solutions that, um, that they think best fit them. Um, and these pieces of legislation uh, that we do have, we have invited college students and professors, uh, people from the CSU Chancellor's Office and other Chancellor's Offices to join us in the implementation along with county advocates and public benefits advocates. And uh, the news is really good. So first we have AB 1930, as you can see on the slide. This was, this was passed in uh, 2004. It was authored by Assemblywoman Skinner who will now be joining the Senate. And um, and what this rule, what this bill does, it was co-sponsored by the Western Center on Law and Poverty and CCWRO um, uh, to try to identify a problem that had been long-standing in the CalFresh program, and that is that there are, uh, is a rule in the in the federal program that says that students participating in school more than half time are ineligible for SNAP, the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, known as CalFresh in California, unless one of these two things happens. First they're eligible for federal exemptions, and these are enumerated in law and in guidance. And second, that, the state is, uh, that they participate in a state-established uh, program, a state-funded program or local-funded program that increases the employability of, um, of a student. Well, in California, we hadn't identified which state-funded programs or locally-funded programs those would be. So even though students were participating in programs that could qualify them if established by the state, those hadn't been established by the state in, a, in an official guidance, and so therefore they weren't exempt. Additionally, some of the federal exemptions um, had no way to verify them. So, um, so in the work group that we have implementing 1930, um, this uh, we are establishing a list of programs that are exempt, and information for counties, county welfare directors, or county human services agencies to verify existing federal exemptions. The work group has uh, published two, two all-county letters, uh, also referred to as guidance, to counties. And we issued a fact sheet. And that fact sheet will be available in the re with the recording of this webinar and as a live link and is also on, our, on the Western Center on Law and Poverty's website. Um, that, that fact sheet has links to those, those all-county letters. The final all-county letter for the work group will come uh, later this year, before January 1st, and it will establish all of the known state-funded programs that uh, qualify somebody for an exemption to the student rule um, and provide better guidance for how to verify federal exemptions. We're really excited about the work of the work group and commend the Department of Social Services for their great leadership in the, in the work group. I, I'm very I, I believe that people will be uh, pleased to see what comes out before the end of the year in this last and final guidance for the work group and encourage you to, to keep posted through the Alliance to Transform CalFesh website or um, Western Center's website. The second piece of legislation that we're implementing, beginning to implement right now, in fact, is AB 1747. This was introduced by Dr. Weber last year and passed in its first year, and it 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 did so because it had great support from um, a diversity of stakeholders, including CSU, Western Center, the, stu the student associations, Young Invincibles, and others. Um, this bill also it, it responded to a, a series of hearings that Dr. Weber held to talk about campus climate. And the goal of the bill was to address the fact that low-income students who are struggling with food insecurity not only are the services not available on campuses, but they don't feel welcome on campus. And so the three things that this, uh, that this legislation did, again, a first step forward, much more left to do, um, but these are meaningful steps. First, it requires the restaurant meal program application for all college, uh, public colleges and, um, and universities in participating counties. There's only seven counties that participate in the restaurant meal program. This program is a program that allows homeless, elderly, and disabled CalFresh recipients to use their CalFresh UBT card to purchase a meal. And, and uh, what the goal of 1747 is that uh, because as many as 10% of public college and university students are homeless, that they don't have a place to prepare the meal, even if they become eligible for CalFresh. 
Um, and so allowing them to be able to use it uh, at a cafeteria on campus or an eatery on campus um, is a good next step. Uh, the second thing it does is it codifies an existing practice of allowing public colleges and universities to participate in the state's CalFresh outreach program. And you'll hear later from CSU about their efforts to participate in that program in several uh, campuses across the state. And then finally, it establishes a yet-to-be-funded fund for college food bank partnerships. This, um, uh, this is, uh, the idea here is to hopefully bring together um, a concept that college campus pantries and food banks should be participating with their, with their county food bank agencies. Um, if they don't already have a partnership, they should have one. If they have a partnership, there's probably some things that uh, they could do to improve, inc improve that partnership and increase um, the food safety and um, expand services on the campus, not just to students, but maybe also to faculty, who we've learned just recently in um, an LA uh, Times expose are also experiencing hunger at um, inappropriately high rates. So, bo uh, so go ahead to the next slide. So if you go to our website at, or if you go to the link of this online uh, webinar, you'll be able to see the, uh, two fact sheets, one published about AB 1747 by Western Center and Young Invincibles and the other on this CalFresh student work rule, um, which is the implementation for AB 1930. We hope these resources will be helpful to you and, uh, and look forward to having the conversation today and beyond today to help reduce college student hunger. Last slide. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jessica. Um, on to our next presenter, we have Dr. Sabrina Sanders from CSU Chancellor's Office to give us an update about what's happening with hunger and the California State University system. Um, good morning, yes. everybody. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Okay. Good morning. Um, I felt like I wanted to start with just giving a little bit of background about the California State University um, system. We have 23 campuses all the way from Humboldt in the north to San Diego in the south with 470,000 students. Um, the CSU student population is very unique. More than half of our students are students of color. With one third of our undergraduates are the first in their families to go to colleges. Um, three out of four of our students work more than 20 hours per week and 54% of our undergraduate students students, recipients of the Pell Grant, a need-based grant offered to low-income students. Um, our chancellor was uh, visiting our 23 campuses uh, about two, three years ago, and on his visits he heard a lot about um, different trends and hot topics that were happening amongst the 23 campuses, but he continued to hear about issues of housing and food security, and he thought he was concerned that that was, if it was anecdotal versus um, actual um, concern. So um, he issued, a, we, we funded a research study just to find out a general um, backing literature, you know, in research, or in higher ed, we're very um, into research. So um, we did a research study held, uh, hosted by Dr. Rashida Crutchfield by Cal State University, Long Beach. And in this phase one of the study, we uh, reported that one in five, or almost 20% of our students, experienced some type of food insecurity, meaning that they could not pay for nutritious food or were forced to regularly skip meals. And we also found about um, 1 in 12 or about 8 to 12 percent of our students experiencing housing displacement. And that means students lacking a stable, permanent, or physical address and were instead uh, forced to couch surf, dorm crash, sleep in shelters, or sleep in their cars. Um, this also includes students who had no permanent home to return to during the holidays and breaks. So uh, Chancellor White um, re uh, funded two more years of an additional study, and we're in year two of the study at this moment. Um, it started last Monday, and we're sending a survey out to all 470,000 students, and that's hosted by Dr. Jen McGuire from California State University Humboldt and Dr. Rashida Crutchfield from Cal State Long Beach, and they'll be doing some also some um, peer group um, discussion groups and, and talking to our various campuses to find a little bit more what the 
causes, the issues are related to food and housing security. Um, and so we look forward to this data to kind of help draw where we're going to be going as a system and addressing food and housing security um, of our CSU students. Um, this past June, um, we hosted a system-wide conference. We had about 200 participants, faculty, staff, students, um, folks from the UC and folks from the California Community Colleges, nonprofit and social service agencies, and really talking about food and housing security issues, um, the literature, research that's going on, best practices, and learning from one another. Um, our uh, California State University, Chico, underwent, um, wrote a CalFresh grant, and we have 15 campuses, I'm sorry, 12 campuses that will be the recipient under the Center for Healthy Communities um, research grant um, through the California Department of Social Services um, to bring innovative CalFresh outreach to college students um, statewide, and that's Los Angeles, Northridge, Long Beach, San Bernardino, Dominguez Hills, Fresno, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, East Bay, Sacramento, Humboldt, and Chico. Chico, and that's led by Dr. Jenny Breed from the California um, State University Chico Center for Healthy Communities. And our goal is to do, really do outreach, education, and find out what students are eligible for um, CalFresh opportunities um, using p uh, the peer um, educators model to reach out to um, other students and get them signed up for um, CalFresh opportunities if they are eligible. Um, we look forward to rolling that out um, at this semester and hopefully that will yield um, increased food um, resources for students that are eligible. Um, another aspect uh, of our of our programs that we've been doing is video conferences and bringing together our system-wide leaders from um, each of our campuses and learning from um, exemplary practices, networking, and uh, communicating what's happening statewide so we can make sure that all of our 23 campuses are on board and supporting one another. Um, our last conference call really highlighted a couple of our programs that um, rolled out a, a holistic model of supporting students that are dealing with ho housing and food security and that was San Diego State University. And um, California State University, Long Beach, um, which provide emergency on-campus housing, hotel vouchers, emergency intervention wellness program, um, including emergency grants, short-term emergency housing, food redistribution, and meal assistance. There's also the financial counseling, um, psychological services, and hands-on management um, program for those students. Um, really a holistic approach to support the students and ensure that they don't fall through the cracks. Um, our next video conference is scheduled the first week of December and we are inviting the USDA um, and uh, California State University Humboldt to highlight the EBT CalFresh program of rolling that out um, on our campuses retail and dining services. We're looking forward to that um, conversation. We've invited the dining services and retail um, outlet managers from all 23 of our campuses and um, starting the discussion on, on that which is not a traditional model um, for our higher education. So. Uh, we look forward as we're increasing the number of students that are potentially eligible for EBT, how do we um, provide those resources through our um, food and dining services on campus. Um, we have a, an amazing host of programs that are happening throughout all of our 23 campuses and, and these have really been rolled out without any additional funding or additional resources and just um, some amazing faculty, staff and, and uh, student affairs administrators that are just so passionate about ensuring our student success. Um, I shared about the Cal State Long Beach and San Diego State model. Um, our Humboldt program has the OSNAP campus food programs which is um, the EBT program, access to food program and, and a food re redistribution app that um, is helping to zero out food waste on campuses. Um, nutrition education, um, celebrating culture through cooking with fresh produce, um, partnering with their local farmers market and community partnering um, to make sure that Humboldt stu State students ha have access to food um, uh, opportunities. Um, San Jose State actually is rolling out today at 10 a.m. their first food pantry, and they've partnered with the Second Harvest Food Bank, um, what will be, which will be a mobile delivery service, um, and 
we were excited about that opportunity um, and looking at other ways of, of providing food opportunities for the students um, where some of our campuses don't have the uh, resources whether it's facility or personnel to host an on-campus food pantry um, but looking at alternative ways, um, San Diego State has a, a model where they partner with Catholic charities and um, throughout the can a year they do some service projects with their fraternity, sorority, clubs and organizations and collect over 10,000 pounds of, of food, um, donated food items that is, um, becomes a credit at the Catholic Charities which is right down the street from the campus and they use Catholic Charities uh, food pantry for uh, distribution of uh, food resources to their campus population. So there's a lot of things happening. We have a lot of uh, faculty that are doing research um, related to um, housing and food issues and poverty of college students and how does that um, affect their um, success as a student and moving towards uh, graduation. And we're really looking forward to from the system-wide effort of um, becoming a pillar of uh, gathering all these research studies and data um, and, and being a home base for that. Um, we look forward to continuing continuing in our ongoing um, conference um, here at the uh, system-wide level as well as supporting our campuses um, system-wide uh, of all the various programs and services that they rolled out as you know with 23 campuses are such a diversity of needs according to the types of students and their geographic location and the types of relationships they have with their county and social service agencies and then we also look forward to um, this next year of, of, of rolling out uh, our partnership with CalFresh and ensuring uh, what type of resources resources are available from a, a state and federal um, level and ensuring that our students that are eligible are indeed knowledgeable about accessing these resources. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to check out our website and there's a, a resource that uh, basic needs postcard that we are listed in the handouts and um, there's our contact information is listed on there as well. Thank you, Dr. Sanders. That was really great information. And if there are any questions anyone's having, um, please type them in now and we'll try to get to them at the end of the webinar. We still have several wonderful presenters on the way. Um, next up is Ruben. Ruben is in the airport. Um, so let's, let's be kind to Ruben. <laughs> He's doing us a great favor. So take it away. Hello everyone, good morning. Thank you so much for allowing me to be part of this webinar and apologize again for being in the in the airport. There's going to be some really exciting um, intercom sounds and hopefully some lovely ch children. And um, thank you so much to the Alliance, thank you so much to the Association and to all the participants that are with us today. Um, my role in this conversation is to invite you all to uh, deepen our collective understanding of what's happening across the University of California system, as well as what are we doing with regards to basic needs security and why is this work needed to begin with, and also a celebration of all of the village that has come together to do you see we have from students all the way to the president and her staff on this. So that's why the intro slide is um, bringing all of these to know that there's student voice, staff voice, faculty voice, administrative voice, and community champions in there. If we could go to the next slide. So um, one of the main messages that we want to make sure that we're clearly stating is the fact that there's currently gaps of information and misinformation with the fact of what makes college and universities affordable or not. And system, one of the biggest points of misinformation is people functioning under the false assumption that tuition and fees is the most expensive aspect of the UC system, where it's actually living cost, rent, utilities, transportation, uh, transportation uh, and books is what students are struggling the most to pay for their UC education. So what you see here is a visualization of the last decade that shows the consistency of how living cost has been higher than tuition and fees and noting the impact that the recession had on living costs and the impact that it had on tuition and fees. When you combine tuition and fees and living costs, it produces the total cost of attendance. Next slide. Apologies. 
apologies if the uh, sound is cutting off. Um, again, I'm in the airport, so I'm going to go a little bit slower. So this next slide is showcasing to folks that we have begun to utilize the USDA module that assesses food insecurity. I'm excited to share with you all here the UC Food Access and Security Report which we're going to go into the next slide and the report was based on the sixth item of the USDA module which is by far the most tested and utilized across the country. So if we can go to the next slide. We partnered with our Nutrition Policy Institute which is uh, within the UC Office of the President. It's a nationally recognized highly credible research center that worked with us to put together a study that was going to focus on two specific areas. Number one was to document the prevalence of food insecurity amongst our undergraduate and graduate populations. And number two was to identify risk factors in the conversation. Next slide. The results were um, based on a sample of 8,900 participants. It is by far the largest study in higher education to date and we're very excited that the CSU will be publishing their study which we are which we're excited is going to be larger than this one but I do want to name that there's a consistency across the country of community college state schools research universities that for the last 10 years have consistently published that the food insecurity Security le levels is between 20 to 72 percent. The largest 72 percent was captured from a study in North Carolina, and our study is consistent with that. The total food insecurity in the UC system is 42 percent, which breaks down to 23 percent of students that were identified as food insecure also grew up being food insecure, which lets us know that the majority of students that are food insecure in the UC system did not grow up being food insecure. That breaks down amongst undergraduate and graduate populations, 48% undergraduates and 25% graduate students. With also a important note that black and uh, Hispanic students are have higher levels of food insecurity than their counterpart demographics and this is a portion where we apologize unfortunately due to proposition 209 we are not able to disaggregate the information by ethnic population but it still points us in a direction of who needs support um, in those population categories next slide So in terms of risk factors, there are some major, major lessons learned here. Folks that have, uh, that identify as having grown up food insecure will most likely be food insecure at a much higher rate than those that grew up food secure. The longer that students stay within the university, their insecurity levels tend to rise, which is a major lesson learned because most of our programs tend to target only incoming students. And then we have this cultural approach that, that older students, continuing students, veteran students, don't necessarily need the resources as much. And the findings of our study challenge that notion and invite us to say older students need just as much if not more support with their basic needs and when you hear me say basic needs what I want you to receive with that is food and housing security so with that we're gonna go to the next slide so that we can talk a little bit more about uh, this basic need conversation UC Berkeley at the moment is the only campus that has conducted a grassroots student-led housing and security study we had a very strong response um, with rep representatives from undergraduate frosh, undergraduate transfer, graduate doctoral, master, and professional. The only population that was overrepresented was our doctoral students. For whatever reason, our master students were not as participants in this. Now, this is not a total sample study. This is a study that was conducted for students that already identified having had the experience or currently experiencing housing insecurity insecurities because we wanted to better understand what was that experience and what type of insecurity that they face. So the next slide helps us understand which type of insecurity is going on with regards to housing. 
there's different types of housing insecurity. Housing insecurity is an umbrella term. The, the most extreme experience of that is homelessness. So when you look at the graph in front of you, you're going to see that both undergraduate and graduate students experience high cost of rent proportionate to their income, meaning that more than 40% of the income that they have available to themselves on a monthly basis is going solely on rent. Then you go into poor housing quality, unstable neighborhood, which refers to safety or lack thereof. Overcrowding, meaning that there's multiple people living in a living in a space where they're not supposed to. That's where living rooms get converted into bedrooms. Bedrooms have additional bunk beds, so on and so forth, which we cannot identify those students as housing secure because all of the students that are not on the lease at best will be uh, kicked out and at worst will have that going to their permanent renter profile in the cities that they are in. And last Lastly, the homeless level is incredibly high uh, amongst this population. 11% of 199 students experience homelessness and 8% of 103 graduate students experience homelessness. And again, this is pretty consistent with the level of housing and security and homelessness that we see nationwide. But it's also equally important to understand that homelessness data is grossly underreported. And I want to invite you all to know and to help us because many folks are addressing this housing insecurity, this homelessness conversation by asking students if they are homeless, which is not an effective tool because many people do not identify it as being homeless because of how stigmatized, how much shame, and how misinformed our population is. If we can go to the next slide. So the Work has been happening across all 10 of our UC uh, campuses for many years, but it wasn't until 2014 where we came together as a UC system to do this work as a system with all 10 of our campuses participating. We established committees at every single campus. We hosted the California Higher Education Food Summit. We prepared a one-year proposal for the president, and it was funded at $75,000 per campus. Last academic year, campuses had $75,000 to do this work, which we prioritize emergency relief and emergency support services, which absolutely included CalFresh. We also collected data to see how many of our students were coming to CalFresh uh, signups, how many were coming to pop-up pantries, how many were coming to the established pantry of the campus. We also completed did a thought exercise that produced a 2020 strategic plan and budget proposal that was submitted to the president and was funded for us to increase from $75,000 to $151,000 for the next two years. And lastly, we updated our system-wide data surveys to include now food insecurity and housing insecurity questions. Next slide. And we're coming to we're coming to the closing of our UC portion. We wanted to confirm to you all that this challenge is is very real. Uh, once we launched all these services in, last, in the last academic year alone, we were able to serve over 52,000 service contacts across the UC system. This is not happening for an exceptional population. There's a critical mass of students that need your help and that are grateful that you are committed to this anti-poverty, anti-hunger, basic need to care work. And this is an affirmation and a gratitude point for you all for doing this work. As Dr. Sabrina mentioned, we are in partnership with our community colleges in CSU. We're going to be circling back with each other this December, and we're going to be partnering to do this work together as a California public higher education movement that's going to move our state leadership and our federal leadership to prioritize basic needs. And we're doing the traveling. As you heard, I'm in Texas. I'm in Austin right now. We just finished the Association for Public and Land Grant Universities. This advocacy is happening very proactively at the system level all the way to the individual need. Next slide. So in closing, we're next, and this is where you all come into the conversation. Next slide. Number one, I want to make sure that you all know that there's four areas to this work. Research, structural engagement, the institutional model that I'm going to show you next, and advocacy. All of this work is being prioritized. Not just the real-time services, not just the systemic, but the holistic intervention as a whole. The next slide that I'm going to show you is what our campus is doing, because I think it's important for you all to see yourselves named as our 
major uh, strategy to support this need, CalFresh right at the middle. The blue areas of our model that you see is all of the all of the information education and cultural shift work that we're doing so that we prioritize basic need security and the gold is for the students that it doesn't matter how much you educate them structurally they're set up to be have gaps of data and have larger challenges with regards to their basic needs so our first response is going to be CalFresh that's why it's so important for us to be grateful for the association this alliance and all folks that are committed with CalFresh because you are our main strategy for this work then you go into to skills development, emergency relief, and crisis resolution. And the last slide that I have to share with you all is how are we coordinating this work. I want to make sure that you all know that there's system level leadership, there's campus coordination happening, there's on-campus services that are partnering with each other so that they know how to refer to one another, there's AFCOF off-campus is with this, which is where all of you all come into this relationship, and there's research and curriculum that we are very committed to sharing in an open source platform with our system partners and with you all so that we can do this, this work effectively, efficiently, and an innovative platform and in a way that will finally make public higher education basic needs secure. Thank you all so much for your attention, and I'm so excited to be partnering with you all moving forward. Um, thank you so much, Ruben. Uh, travel safely. Again, everyone, that was Ruben Canetto. He is the Research and Mobilization Coordinator for the Centers for Educational Equity and Excellence. And I've included his email address here. If you have any follow-up questions, please don't hesitate to contact him. He's a wonderful advocate. Um, next up, we have Amanda Schultz. Brochu. She is the CalFresh Outreach Director at the San Diego Hunger Coalition. Amanda, please take it away. Hi all, thank you so much for having me um, and thanks so much to the Alliance to getting us all together to talk about this really important issue. Um, we're really excited to be working together with everyone. Um, yes, yeah, so you can jump to the next slide. Great, so just some quick background. A lot of the work that um, San Diego Hunger Coalition has been doing in this space um, resulted from a few different areas. Um, and for those of you who um, may not have heard of the Hunger Coalition before, we're a nonprofit that's based in San Diego. Uh, we support nonprofit organizations that are providing CalFresh application assistance and um, particularly focus on building linkages with our county health and human service agency. So uh, when I think just an amazing job of outlining the pieces of legislation. Um, we kind of got started with this work when AB 1930 was passed, um, looking at different ways to really um, build on the momentum that had been generated at the state level. Um, and then also when there are a number of different reports that came out highlighting the relationship um, between food security and academic success um, and just really highlighting the, the prevalence of food insecurity on college campuses um, that really provided us a space to start bringing folks together to talk about opportunities and potential solutions at the local level. So. Um, the Hunger Coalition coordinates what's called the CalFresh Task Force, and it brings together all of our nonprofit organizations providing application assistance across the county with representatives from our county health um, and human service agency. And every year, our task force votes on focus areas for the coming year. And at the end of 2000. 15, our CalFresh task force uh, identified that they wanted to focus their efforts on connecting college students to CalFresh as, as an area of focus for this year. Uh, next slide. So uh, what we did is um, we spent you know, a few months really just building relationships, identifying who would be best to partner with. And uh, the role that Hunger Coalition took in that process is um, we, we really thought about who would make the most sense to bring to the table from college campuses and state universities. And so we focused first on three, three major areas, um, EOPS, financial aid, and student disability services. So what we did is we went out um, researched and figure out, figured out who would be the best points of contact at each community college um, for their EOPS financial aid and student disability service programs. Um, we sent them all 
specific emails. We followed up, made phone calls, inviting them to the task force meeting, let them know that this is an area of focus for, for all of the nonprofits in the area. And I think just having them hear from us directly that there were nonprofits that not only recognized that this was an issue, um, but were committed to bringing resources to their college campuses was um, really a, a great way to create movement in this space. Um, so then we invited all of our um, CalFresh representatives and, and college representatives to a joint meeting. And at that very first meeting, what we really tried to do was focus on basics. So uh, we outlined CalFresh student eligibility basics, made sure that everyone had um, a specific starting on the same page with a basic understanding of knowledge. Uh, we then broke down the CalFresh application process as it um, pertained to students and identified opportunities where collaboration could improve outreach and access for students. Next slide. Thanks. So um, one of the things, you know, kind of our initial questions and insights that came out was there is a ton of interest in this area. Um, all of the, we had great feedback from community colleges at our first meeting. We had four different community colleges represented as well as our, um, one of our state universities. Um, there were a lot of questions around basic eligibility. So I think one of the lessons that we learned was that taking that time to get everyone on the same page was extremely beneficial. Um, there were a lot of questions and, and um, a lot of interest in focusing on verification. So once we broke down that application process into specific steps, we found that the area that students, um, at least in our county, were really getting stuck on um, were related to what verifications were needed, how could they get a hold of those verifications, um, and what was the best way to support students in getting access to those verifications. Um, and so that's where engaging our our community college and CSU partners has been incredibly helpful in, in helping us think through that. And it was also great be having the county um, in the room because they were able to share some of their challenges um, and being able to get documents in a timely fashion. They're able to ask questions around verifications and then they could bring all of that information back to the county offices and, and to the eligibility workers that are on the front line. So it's resulted in a lot of training of our county staff. Um, and then finally, what um, another area that we ended up spending a decent amount of time on in the beginning and continue to do so is what is the best way to connect with students? Who is the best messenger? What, what is the best message that's going to resonate with them? Next slide. Um, so in thinking about this work, what, what we've really found to be most successful is, is leveraging resources on both sides of the table. Um, so when we're thinking about you know, working with community colleges and state universities, some of the things that we found when we're engaging um, engaging folks is really that we found EOPS has been one of our strongest allies in connecting with college students. So um, some of the things that they've shared with us that have been really interesting and, and thought might be helpful to share is that um, students have EOPS contracts that they need to renew and sign every six months. Um, so that's been a great tool to use to verify um, participation in the program. We've also found that the EOPS PS officers uh, have really easy access to all of the student financial information. So um, unfortunately, we weren't able, haven't been able to um, develop relationships with financial aid offices yet. Um, but I think that the EOPS officers have been really um, supportive in getting students access to the information. Um, also, the EOPS officers and, and really all the college people um, representatives that we worked with are really committed to student success and interested in connecting students to any available resources. Um, and then presentation attendance can be um, used as an activity to meet EOPS contract requirements, which is um, really kind of a nice win-win for both groups. And then um, in working with the student disability uh, services staff, um, we found that they're you know, really willing to help students access necessary information and speed up that verification process internally. Um, and we've also found a lot of interest and willingness to integrate CalFresh application assistance directly into the intake process. So I'll talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. Um, next slide. So um, to date, we kind of
kind of coming out of those meetings, uh, we have five partnerships that have been developed between community colleges and CalFresh application assistance organizations, and they all look a little bit different. But um, three of the partnerships are providing application assistance workshops on a regular basis. Uh, it looks like a lot of them are developing it around the beginning of the, the school um, quarters. So whether that's quarterly or semester, um, they're going to be doing workshops at the very beginning when students are coming back in to, to catch new folks who are arriving and um, make sure that they're saturating as many, getting as many eligible students as possible. We have another organization that's doing phone-based application assistance through an online app and then one more um, community-based organization that's uh, providing same-day service events by partnering with account with the county to come out and sign students up on the spot. And that's been particularly successful in moving from application to approval as the student is able to, they, we set up the same day service events in the community resource center so that students have access to computers to be able to um, go in, pull down all the verifications needed, whether that's their EOPS contract or their financial aid statement, they can sign into a portal where they're able to pull all that information right away um, and bring it into the interview with the county there um, at the resource center and, and find out if they're eligible on the spot. Um, we also have a partnership that is developing with our um, local state university and their student disability services department. So um, again, talking about developing an intake application assistance process, we've trained the student disability service staff as application, CalFresh application assisters, um, and they're really committed to uh, making that work. So um, they're really excited about some of the new ACL language that's going to be coming out, making it easier to determine which students are, um, are eligible for that 20-hour work exemption. Um, and, and we think that this is going to be a really great way to, to be able to enroll any and all eligible students in CalFresh on the spot. Next slide. Um, you know, fin finally, some of our outcomes and lessons learned. This is definitely a new area of focus for our task force members. And, um, so we're learning that this relationship building really takes time. So not only did we send out individual emails, we followed up with multiple phone calls, and we have monthly meetings that these community college and state university representatives are attending, but there's a lot of um, outside meetings that are, are occurring too to kind of brainstorm new and innovative models to engage students in. Um, we're learning that there's a significant amount of outreach that needs to occur before some of these workshops, um, especially because students have so many competing priorities um, that we really want to make sure that not only they get there, but they recognize this is a really good use of their time. Um, we're also finding that a lot of students are, because they're technology savvy, they're willing to apply on their own online. Um, and so we're kind of trying to weed through and figuring out what that means. How can community-based organizations still be helpful in moving that application to approval? And one of the areas that we're looking at is how can we, again, support with that verification process and making sure that students are able to attend their interview. Um, and then just recognizing the significant opportunity for impact. Um, one of the community colleges that we're working with alone has over 1,800 students enrolled in their EOPS program. Um, and so this, you know, as we were working with multiple organizations across the county, we're recognizing that there's a lot of opportunity. And next slide. Um, so that's all the information I have. There's a couple other areas that we're thinking about moving into. Um, we've had a lot of interest among our community colleges of, of figuring out other ways to support students. A lot of them do have food pantries. Um, we are looking at having an EBT sign-up day for all of the retailers at community colleges and state universities so that it could be similar to the farmers markets where all of the retailers can go to one day or half day workshop that they're immediately signed up and receive their point of sale device just to streamline that application and enrollment process and make it um, more attractive to sign up. And then we're also um, you know, in conversations with the California Community College Foundation. Um, in their Fresh Success program, they're looking for community colleges that are interested in um, 
in accessing additional funding streams for the EOPS department. Um, and that can really kind of support and incentivize some of this CalFresh outreach and application assistance work. So we're really excited about bringing folks together and talking about what that could look like. Uh, but yeah, if you have any questions about these programs or would like to learn more about some of the specifics, I'd be happy to talk with individuals in, um, later on. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Amanda. Um, all of these examples of really innovative partnerships are really wonderful to share. And I think that a lot of people viewing this webinar will be able to, you know, st start from an inspiration point. Um, our next presenter is Amy Dearlam of River City Food Bank in Sacramento and she's going to be talking to you all about how her organization and other folks are tackling college hunger in Sacramento County. Amy, please take it away. Right. Can you hear me? We sure can. Thank you. Okay, great. I want to make sure. So thank you again for allowing me to share. Um, we have we've decided to focus on Sacramento State. Um, we are starting to branch out to other community colleges at this point we've had a, a we had a relationship with Sac State already with their wellness center um, they were finding through counseling students that um, the students were coming for emotional help but found in talking with them that really the underlying issue was also food insecurity so they reached out to us and asked us to come and speak with their students as well as um, training their peer health educators on CalFresh. And so for the last four years, we've had that relationship where we um, have been training and had the well um, on campus as a place where people could go and get uh, applications and, and apply. And also the peer health educators, we also did field trips here to the food bank so that they could see the, what students could access here. We're about four or five, we're about five miles from Sac State. So last fall when the ACL uh, notice went out about CalFresh student eligibility to all counties, um, talking about eligibility and how students can be, become more eligible, um, we decided to look closer at where could we be going in addition to the well on campus. I have usually three to five student interns from sex. Amy, we lost you. Let's see. Amy? She definitely seems gone. I can't hear her either. This is Jessica Bartho. OK. Um, how about, in the interest of time, we move on to our next presenter, and then if Amy joins us again, we'll come back. So, uh, next up is Young Invincibles. Let's see. Oh gosh, I'm forwarding your slides. Hold on. And I'm on the line here. Okay, so this is Gustavo Herrera. Gustavo, Hi, take it away. Hi, everybody. Um, first off, uh, thank you so much for uh, the opportunity uh, to share some of our work here and to, to join this call. I'll try and make this quick um, so that we can um, offer some time for questions. But uh, my name is Gustavo Herrera, and I'm the director of Young Invincibles. Uh, Young Invincibles is a national policy advocacy organization dedicated to millennials. Uh, so that's young adults ages 18 to 34. Uh, just to share a little bit of background with you, that started back in 09. This was uh, really around it, back when there was a national dialogue on the Affordable Care Act. Our founders were at a Georgetown Law cafeteria, uh, really listening to this national dialogue on health care reform in what they didn't hear was a young adult perspective. Uh, and so what they started to do is to organize a young adult voice around the issue. Um, slide. So if we fast forward six years, uh, now Young Invincibles, you know, was started as an idea uh, in a small Georgetown cafeteria. 
uh, by a few passionate students. It's now a national organization with about six regional offices across the country. Uh, we have offices in D.C., New York, Colorado, Texas, Illinois, uh, and I, read, uh, I lead the western region um, of, of the organization, which includes California, about six other states. Uh, to summarize, um, oh, and next slide here. To summarize, our, our mission uh, is very much the same as when we were first conceptualized. Uh, we're really here to amplify the voices of young adults in the political process uh, with the goal to expand economic opportunity um, and, am and amplify the voice of, of young adults in the political process uh, for our generation. Um, slides. So we really work across three major issue areas. The issue areas include higher ed, economic security, slash jobs, um, and, and also healthcare. We see all of these issues as interconnected issues that if we can hopefully address them together with our great base of partners. Uh, we can really begin to strengthen young adults, um, their economic opportunity and political strength. So here's how we really came to sort of organizing around AB 1747. Uh, back in 2015, uh, Young Invincibles led a listening tour, uh, really to talk to young adults about jobs, unemployment, underemployment, um, employment generally. Um, and what we heard while we were on the road, uh, we connected with about 13 different groups across the state, uh, was largely um, stories of, uh, of young adults' experiences. And to our surprise, uh, we came across a good number of anecdotal stories that touched on issues of housing and food insecurity, uh, which is really when, when this issue was sort of put um, when we first um, came across this issue um, and through various conversations with great partners, um, being able to connect to other resources and great data from some of the presenters that have been on this great call, um, we, uh, we, we made it one of our big priority issue areas for, for this year. Um, and we are very, very proud uh, to be co-sponsors and, and organizers around the AB 1747 bill, um, along with many of you. Uh, we're grateful for the opportunity. Um, slides. So just in short, to share with you, uh, this was our strategy in the 2016 year, what we hope to contribute to, uh, to the coalition. Uh, we work very closely uh, with Western Center on Law and Poverty. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Uh, amazing partners on this line. Assemblymember Weber's office and, and really brave young adults who shared their stories to media, um, who testified at, at key meetings, um, and, and really worked to uh, begin to influence decision makers. Uh, we also did a lot uh, to leverage our digital tools, uh, all of our social media tools, uh, which included uh, driving participation via Twitter town halls. Um, we drove online petitions in partnership with everyone here uh, to get 800 to close to 1,000 petitions submitted um, right around the sort of timely point. Um, and uh, and we're we're very very happy um, that of course AB 1747 was passed. We're um, excited to to continue the work this this upcoming year. And I wanted to just sort of share uh, what we're thinking for this upcoming year, um, and of course extend a, a broad invitation to anyone interested here um, to to work with us. Um, we we want to continue to of course contribute. In, that, in any way that we can to, to this work. Um, so in short, on, on the outreach front, uh, we have a Young Advocates Program, which is really our peer educator. Uh, oh, and actually, next slide. Um, we have a peer uh, educator model, which we call the Young Advocates Program. Uh, it's a statewide program, uh, and our young advocates are, are really working on college campuses, uh, working across broad uh, regions as well. Um, so our young advocates will be strategically placed and um, will work to basically help inform students of changes uh, via a statewide meetup series 
um, and tabling on college campuses and so forth. Um, next slide. Uh, we will also um, activate our digital uh, platforms, um, organizing Twitter town halls, which of course we would love to have you all join. Um, we also have a, a story bank process within our organization, which uh, if there are any stories of individuals um, who, who want to share their experience, uh, we have a set protocol for how to both capture stories and, and then leverage them out, out into the community. Um, so we'll certainly be activating our story bank around this. Um, and we're just also just very excited uh, for the opportunity to continue to work with all of you um, in our organizing and our policy work for 2017. Um, of course, we'll, we'll share our information. Um, feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, if you're interested in, in either the Young Advocates Program or if you're interested in our story banking process, et cetera, we hope to be a resource uh, to all of you here. Uh, so thank you so much for, for the opportunity. Um, and that sums up my presentation. Excellent. Thank you so much, Gustavo. We really appreciate all that information. Um, it's so, so nice to know that there are a lot of really amazing young advocates um, ready to join us. So I'm going to go back to Amy here from Sacramento. Okay. Excuse me um, going through these slides. Amy, take it away. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Okay, so what we did again is this is looking at a, a CBO going out to a campus and how to look for students who might be eligible and making relationships on campus. So as I was stating, we have three to five Sac State interns every semester. So I utilized those um, in finding uh, connections on campus. I made connections as well, but I wanted them to go to specific offices. So we looked at the financial aid office, the services to students with disability, um, the EOP office, EOPS office, which I came to find out was community college. But we did go to the EOP office, and I know at this point EOP is not and my understanding not um, considered yet, but will be. And so we're going to recreate that relationship as well. But in services, the wellness center, counseling, all of these places are good places to go. Um, student affairs or services as well. So these are the areas we looked at and um, addressed. And the next slide. Are we on the next next slide? Okay, so the next step was to make appointments with these folks. And so I had my interns find out who the head person was and made a point, set up appointments. I thought it was a good exercise for the student to, to do, as well as for um, the department to see that students were interested in this topic enough. And so we made appointments with them, um, brought materials, brought packets of information um, for their all of their staff. Um, we also created uh, advertisements on campus as well. Um, the placement of posters has been really advantageous for us. Um, particular places where they the students have to stand in line, we have posters there, and so many students have come to us saying, I saw your poster, I was standing in line waiting for financial aid or waiting to register, and that's where I saw your, your, your poster. So really good pl placement of, of materials is really important. And then offering to present. We have presented um, in nutrition classes and dietetic classes. We've also presented um, to financial aid uh, workshops as well as um, EOP office staff. And so presenting not only in the classroom, but also workshops on campus open to all students or open to specific staff. So those are tools that have helped us gain more access on campus and to students directly, as well as educating staff and giving staff the resources they need to help connect with students with us or with CalFresh. Next slide. The financial aid office is one that really grasped the concept with us, um, especially knowing that work-study students, if they, if they met the other qualifications that work-study would allow them to be able to possibly be eligible. So last spring, they put on a campus-wide workshop and advertised it to all the work-study students. Um, we did a one-day, uh, one-afternoon workshop where we did also did application as well as uh, presentation. 
And with that, we began this ongoing relationship with them. So for this small semester, they have orientation workshops that they do. And they did about 20 workshops. We were probably present at 12, 12 to 15 of them. Um, and we were a part of the workshop. So not only um, so not only could we present, but we, they gave us time during the workshop. And then following the workshop, we were available to do application assistance. And that has been a great relationship. They are going to be doing that again for next semester, and that will be going an ongoing relationship. Since then, also, there's been a work-study job fair we've been invited to, where all the work-study are find, trying to find placements. They can find placements with us as well. And then further internship and volunteer uh, fair as well. So it's created ongoing relationships where they seek us out and we come on campus and assist and I expect that will continue. Next slide. So there's my information. I know we're over time so I want to make this brief. Um, we are now working with some community colleges, same situation where they're having us come and present. They're offering extra credit to students or some classes are offering credit to come to the workshop. Um, also, staff from different offices are coming, learning about the program, and then figuring out how we can create relationships whereby they can assist with the application process so we don't have to be there all the time. So it's going beyond Sac State into the area community colleges, and that's an example of how we've tried to reach more students on Sac State. All right. Thank you so much, Amy. I really appreciate it. And for all of you that are still on, I'm going to advance through to this slide here, which is your opportunity to engage in um, a statewide advocacy effort. The Alliance to Transform CalFresh has something called the CalFresh Excellence Pledge. Um, with a live link there in the corner, you can agree to advance your county and your state's overall CalFresh participation rate. Um, again, this is important because we're talking about um, student populations. They're a hard to reach population. Hopefully soon to not be hard to reach population given all of the great work that's happening across the state. Um, if you have any questions at all about the pledge or any of the presenters that we featured today, please don't hesitate to contact me. I am Sarah Palmer DeFrank. Um, and also we have a really great website. And you can find that at transformcalfresh.org. The webinar will be featured there with a lot of other really wonderful resources um, pertaining to CalFresh specifically. Again, I want to thank all of the presenters who were involved today, um, jumping through many technology hurdles. I appreciate your effort and your skill, and um, wanted to just thank everyone for attending. Uh, do we have